Hi, first I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on our second quarter webinar for 2021. Today we're going to be covering load estimation and we have a co-presenter today, Jason Kahn with Kahn Engineering, and he's going to provide kind of the engineer lens uh, looking through this while I'm going to be providing the contractor lens looking into this for uh, load estimation. So just to give you an outline of what we're going to touch on today, um, I'm going to give you a kind of an introduction to Intech anchoring and, and who we are at Intech, uh, then talk about the required parameters for load estimation, go through an example load estimation, uh, then we're going to develop a pile plan, and then Jason's going to take over and talk about load transfer and transfer of load between piles, uh, assessing crack patterns, and he's also going to go over load combinations and commercially loaded structures. So now I'm going to give you an introduction to who we are at Intec. I wanted to start by giving you kind of a, an overview of the, the staff you'd be directly interfacing with when you're trying to get projects quoted and designed. So more specifically, this is our sales team. It consists of five primary individuals. And these are the ones you're going to be interfacing with when you're getting quotes and, and they help manage all of our sales. Uh, the top five individuals here are Bill, Jack, Joe, and Corey. And there are sales managers in their respective markets for our product offerings. Uh, in the bottom row, we have Jim Sorrell, who's our global sales manager for Hydroway. And uh, he's been here a long time and he's extremely knowledgeable about Hydroway and the whole Hydroway product line. So if you need anything uh, regarding the Hydroway, Jim Sorrell is gonna be your guy there. So like I said, these are the people that are, you're gonna be directly interfacing with uh, when you're trying to get your jobs quoted. Uh, and last but certainly not least, this is our engineering staff that's comprised of myself and Sean Hibbets. We take care of engineering quoting, design assistance during the design phase, including calculations, drawings, and value engineering options. And it can also help out during the installation. Although our regional sales manager has seen a lot of stuff and they'll be able to help out in, during the installation phase as well. So we currently have two warehouse locations. Uh, Caseyville, which acts as our St. Louis uh, hub, and Livonia, Michigan, which acts as our Detroit hub. So we represent these brands on the screen, as well as some others that help provide a, a wide array of engineering solutions to our partners. And just kind of going through the list here, uh, Chance and Atlas represent our line of helical anchors and resistance anchors. Uh, resistance anchors are some type, sometimes called push piers. Um, we are one of a handful of Chance distributors representing a good portion of the middle of the country up through the Northeast. And Chance is an extremely well-respected manufacturer with over a hundred years of experience in the industry. And you know they also have experienced engineers that can give additional recommendations and gut checks for you know, special situations. Second, MagnaCore is our brand of hollow bar micropile, which is a specific type of micropile installation. Uh, it's a one pass method of installation that is very effective in maintaining an open hole in collapsible soils without having to advance and withdraw casing to keep the hole open. So Carbon Bond is our carbon fiber structural crack repair system. It's a composite resin carbon fiber reinforcing that provides tensile strength to the existing structures and can help increase the capacity of the structure or help to repair it if it's undergone cracking failures. It's an effective bandage that can potentially reduce the costs associated with changing the strengths of an existing member. Uh, and there's also an, a, an additional benefit of carbon bond that it will provide a really good waterproofing barrier in addition to a crack injection system. Finally, Hydroway is our geosynthetic wrap strip drain product. It's an effective way of transmitting water through an underground pipe channel without the concern of moving the soils with the water flow. It has a high permeability and, and flow through rate that is a cost effective underground piping and water management solution. I want to include my contact information on the screen. If you have any questions or comments on anything you see today or anything you'd like to see presented in the future or need any design assistance, please feel free to reach out and contact me at any point. So here's a graphic representation of our footprint with Chance Helical Peers and Atlas Resistance Peers. This is our territory where our partners are based, and we have a lot of activity and experience in these areas with local engineers and contractors. This image shows a footprint of where we market our hollow bar micropile, MagnaCore. As you see, we're not restricted to a territory uh, with this solution. So feel free to reach out to us at any point if you need any assistance designing hollow bar MagnaCore micropiles. 
uh, even outside of the United States, uh, we're able to sell it anywhere. Finally, here's our Hydroway footprint. We currently sell and market the solution worldwide. So please reach out if you have any need for Hydroway. So to kick off, we're gonna go over the required parameters for load estimation and kind of what you need to be looking for uh, when you're going to a job site. So the first and uh, most important point is, you know, is the structure you're looking at a commercial structure or is it a residential structure? Um, and then the second thing you have to analyze is the dimensions of the structure. Uh, and that, that includes the entire footprint of the structure, not just, you know, the area that's, that's problematic. So then you want to look at the type and depth of the foundation. Is it a, on a slab on grade? Is it a crawl space foundation? Does it have a basement? And then in particular, you also want to look at, you know, how much overburden is above the foundation. So then you also want to look at construction materials. Is it masonry walls, wood walls, vinyl walls? Because, you know, all these different types of materials are going to have different loading associated with them. And then lastly, uh, the local snow load factors are going to be important. And you can make assumptions on this, but there are uh, published sources that have local snow load factors for pretty much every region. So, so what I'm going to talk about is the chance load estimation tables. And this is kind of looking through a contractor's lens of an easy way to estimate uh, the load on a structure. Um, and it's going to involve kind of the parameters I just discussed on the previous slide. So you can see when you look at this table, uh, this table is specifically designed for residential buildings with concrete slab fours. And you can see at the top of the table, it kind of lists off uh, different dimensions. And then as you go down the, the column on the left there, it lists off you know different properties of the structures as well. So it's going to be important to kind of line up your structure with, with one of these tables and, uh, and, and see where your structure fits. And we're going to touch more on this uh, later. So similar to the last table, this would be residential buildings that had basements instead of just on a slab. And you would use this table the same way where you'd line up uh, the construction of your building on the left uh, with the dimensions and come up with your load estimation. So this table would be used for commercial buildings. And as you can see, going down the slide on the left here, uh, there's only, really, this is only accurate for precast walls on slab fours and on, you know, traditional footings. Th this is not going to be a good estimation for, like, any type of isolated columns or uh, anything unique, and, and we're going to touch more on that later. So estimating live loads, uh, this is going to be similar to the previous tables where you line up your type of structure uh, with the dimensions and come up with your live load estimation. And then lastly, this table uh, kind of comes up with an estimated soil overburden load. And you may not always have the, the depth of the footing or the width of the footing or the, or the soil type. Um, this is kind of where you as a contractor may need to make some assumptions, um, you know, do the best you can, but Typically, you should be able to get a pretty good feel for the overburden, uh, but you may not know if it's cohesive or granular. And then when you look at this table, uh, there's two, two loads represented, WB1 and WB2. So for our purposes, we want to look at only WB1. Uh, WB2 would be a situation where you're lifting the structure, not just trying to stabilize it. Uh, and in general, as a, as a rule of thumb, we always try to just stabilize the structure versus lifting the structure because sometimes you can get in a situation where you're you know, damaging the structure more trying to lift it than if you had just stabilized it. So the last factor that you wanna, wanna get is the snow load. And going over the snow load, here's the equation on the screen here. Um, there's a few key components of the equation and, and kind of how it works. So the first is the snow load factor, which is a given in PSF and it's, it's specific to the region, and you can see on this map here on the right, um, there's, it typically ranges anywhere from zero to like up to 50. Uh, usually around 20 is a good estimation if you don't you know, have access to one of these maps or, or can't find one. Um, but then the second half of the equation there is basically uh, the width and length of the structure to give you the area and the perimeter. Basically, that's converting that PSF snow load on the roof 
to a line load uh, per linear foot around the perimeter. So now let's talk about when it doesn't make sense to do a load estimation. Uh, commercially structures greater than two stories, uh, commercial structures that house large machinery, and anything outside of budgetary or planning phase for a commercial structure. And so what do you do in this situation? Uh, you contact the structural engineer record for the original or the renovation plans that had been verified the load. Uh, and more specifically, talking about when it doesn't make sense to do a load estimation, um, you could have a commercial structure that is only one story, but like I, like I said, if it has a large machinery or it's a very unique construction um, or any type of isolated column structure instead of like typical precast walls on slabs, uh, those are very unique in terms of building materials and, and difficult to come up with the with the lows from an estimation standpoint. So what you come up with, you know, even if you go to be conservative, you could just be way off. So it's it's not a good idea to not involve the engineer record on a commercial structure that's out of the ordinary. So now we're gonna go through an example load estimation. So first uh, you're gonna go on a site visit to, uh, you know, look at the issue and see exactly where the issue is. So that'd be the first step is, you know, coming up with exactly the area where the issue is at. And you're going to take some detailed photographs of it and uh, make a schematic of the structure when you're on the site, right there when you're on the site, not not when you get back to the office. But when you're in the in the, in the field looking at the site, uh, note anything special going on with the structure. As you can see in this image, there's a garage door. So, you know, doorways, windows, uh, utilities, anything going on outside the structure, you're going to want to point out in your schematic so you can avoid that in your pile plan. So developing this tight schematic, and we just kind of touched on this, but you want to have detailed dimensions of the entire structure and not just the affected areas. So kind of the image on the right would be a bad example of what you what you want. And, and this image just shows uh, the affected area of this structure versus the entire structure. And you know, going back to those load estimation tables, uh, a lot of them were based off the dimensions of the entire structure. So not having a good feel for the entire structure size is not going to lead you down the path to coming up with an accurate load estimation. So you're going to want to gather as much information as you can on the existing foundation, um, whether it be the depth, the width, or the reinforcement. And you're probably not going to be able to find some of that information, but you know, as much as you can tell visually, or get from you know, the, the original structure plans, uh, the more it's gonna help you. And the more detailed you are in the preliminary end with your schematic and your site visit, you know, the more effective your solution is gonna be and the more accurate your load estimation is gonna be. So shown on the right here is a good example of a site schematic. As you can see, the entire building footprint is clearly dimensioned. Um, there's utilities that were there and doorways that are you know, marked on the plans as well as the affected area uh, as clearly indicated on the plans. And whenever you're detailed like this on the front end of a project, it makes coming up with a pile plan and coming up with a load estimation, you know, much more simpler and much, much more accurate um, when you're more detailed on the front end. So coming up with a good site schematic is really going to help you uh, in the long run. So developing the design load, uh, the design load is comprised of a few components, and we touched upon this earlier in the load tables, but you have your dev load, your live load, your overburden, and your snow load. And ultimately, what we're coming up with is a line load along the perimeter spread footing. So once you've developed your, your design load, you've looked at your tables, you're going to come up with your ultimate load and then your, your uh, per pile load. So you're going to take your design load and multiply it by a factor of safety of and you know, typically for, for piles, it's two. And then you have your ultimate load per foot. Uh, and then you multiply that by your spacing and you come up with what is the ultimate pile load uh, per pile. So coming up with a design load, in a bit, this is based on that schematic I showed on the slide previous. It was a 40 by 60 structure. So you can see we've gone to that 40 by 60 column. And it was a two-story structure with masonry walls. So as you can see, we come up with a load of 2,028 pounds per linear foot for our design case. So coming up with the live load, uh, similarly to the dead load, 
we're going to go to the column for a 40 by 60 structure and then go to the two story uh, residential over basement. And we're coming up to a live load of 923 pounds per linear foot. And then looking at the overburden. So like I said earlier, uh, we're only going to want to look at the WB1 case. And that's when you're not lifting and you're just stabilizing the structure. And I'm going to assume that the height of overburden in this case, since we have a basement, is six feet. So we're coming up with a overburden load of 330 pounds per linear foot. And I'm also assuming co or cohesive material versus granular. So snow load, uh, this is a fictitious structure, but I'm going to say it's right here in St. Louis. And as you can see from the image on the right, the snow load factor for the kind of the Midwest St. Louis region is 20 pounds per square foot. And if we take that 20 pounds per square foot and put it into that snow load equation from earlier that has the perimeter and the area of the building, we come up with a 240 pounds per linear foot load along the spread footer. So now at this stage, what you want to do is take your dead load, your live load, your overburden, and your snow load and combine them to come up with your total design load. And in this case, it would be 3,521 pounds per linear foot. So, you know, the next step would be take that, multiply it by your factor of safety of two, and we're at 7,042 pounds per linear foot. So now we're going to talk about developing a pilot plan because, you know, coming up with a load is only part of the story. You also have to use that load to develop a pilot plan that, that makes sense for, for your structure based on that load. So when you're developing your pilot plan, you've got a few main objectives you're trying to accomplish. Uh, the first is you want to optimize your spacing such that you're utilizing, you know, as much of the capacity of your desired pile bracket combination as possible. Then you want to optimize your spacing for two technical concerns. You know, you want your piles to not be too deep. And this is going to be, you know, kind of a challenging one to do because for underpinning, especially in residential, you're not going to have soil borings most of the time. So any judgment you have about a particular area is going to help you on, on this one. Uh, but this is something that experience is going to come to play in. So the last objective is coming up with the most efficient design using the smallest material possible with the fewest amount of piles as possible. And it's going to be kind of a combination of design objectives one and two to, to get to that last objective. But it's the overall objective is the most efficient design. So there's a few design concerns you have to take into consideration when you're developing a pile plan. Your minimum pile spacing has to be three times your largest helix diameter or three foot minimum as a rule of thumb. So if you're using a, a you know, your a 10 inch plate as your largest plate, you still want to abide by that three foot minimum just to be conservative. And then you also want your piles to be spaced the minimum of 2.5 feet from the corners. And this is going to be different for new construction versus uh, underpinning situation. For underpinning specifically, you can uh, break off the corner of the foundation, and then you wouldn't be able to transfer the load to the rest of the foundation. And then ideally, your piles wouldn't be under the location of a window, entryway, or any type of utility. And this goes back to what I was discussing earlier, where the more detailed you are on the front end coming up with your schematic and your pile plan, you know, you're not going to run into a situation where they get in the field and there's a utility obstruction, obstructing the installation. So pile spacing cannot be so excessive such that the footing cannot transfer the load. And Jason is going to discuss this a little bit further, but essentially, uh, you know, residential foundations are not designed with point loads in mind. So we need to have that in the back of our mind when, when, when you're developing a pile plan. And then lastly, uh, interior and exterior alternating uh, and lifting considerations. So you can get into a situation where if you've got a very, you know, long wall, and you have a lot of piers on one side, you can put a torsional moment at the corners and you could basically rip out, you know, the wall from the corners. And it's a little bit more of a detailed calculation, but it's something to keep in mind where if you've got a really long span of wall with a bunch of piers on one side, uh, it's something to think about. So the first objective uh, we talked about was optimizing your spacing, but that you're utilizing as much of the capacity as possible. And as you can see here, I have kind of a design load versus spacing calculation where I go through what the design load looks like at different spacing increments. And whenever you're looking at the, 
the tables for the chance material, you can see that whenever you go from five foot versus seven foot, you're basically jumping up a size and material and bracket that you need. Um, so you'd want to look at kind of both options, but have, have in the back of your mind that, you know, a, a different spacing is going to result in different material possibly. So the second design objective was, you know, looking at geotechnical concerns and not wanting your piles to go too, too deep. So again, I've highlighted the five foot and seven foot as the best possible uh, cases for, for this particular structure. And you can see the, the design load uh, multiplied by the factor of safety and the spacing gives you the ultimate loads of 35 kips and 49 kips. And whenever you take that uh, into the capacity torque relationship with the torque correlation factors, you're coming up with you know, almost 1,500 foot pounds more of installation torque that's required uh, for that seven foot spacing design. And, you know, this goes back to your own experience. If you know that you're typically getting 3,500 foot pounds of torque at 15 feet, uh, but you may not get, you know, 4,900 foot pounds till 60 feet or greater, you know, maybe the five foot makes more, more sense in that application. So the last objective is, you know, coming up with the most efficient design using the smallest material possible. So looking at, again, the five foot spacing and the seven foot spacing, the five foot spacing, you're going to have more piles, you're going to have 19 piles. And seven foot spacing, uh, you end up with 15 piles. And again, this is a fictitious design case, but this is just to illustrate that the spacing, you know, could have a pretty big difference in terms of the amount of piles that you come up with on your plan. So specifically for the five and seven foot case, I've kind of got a breakdown of, you know, the pros and cons of each of those. For the five foot design case, and, and, you know, this is an assumption that this might go 21 foot. Uh, you're going to have a cheaper pile because it's got a lighter load, which is going to mean a cheaper bracket as well. Uh, but the, the con there is you're going to have more piles and more labor, uh, you know, associated with installing more piles. For the seven foot section, you know, it's safe to assume that's going to be somewhat deeper because it's a higher load. And, and that higher load also means it's going to be a more expensive pile section and a more expensive bracket. You know, on the upside, though, you're going to have less piles and less labor. And it's kind of a balancing act where if you increase your spacing, you are also increasing the load and every job is going to be different. And that balance point of, you know, what spacing is going to make the most sense is going to be unique for you know every design case and it's important to kind of look at it each time and say okay what can i get with this spacing versus this spacing because you know it may look more expensive on paper uh with with more piles but it may actually be the cheaper solution so now i'm going to hand it off to jason khan he's going to talk about load transfer Hey, Sam, this is uh i appreciate that this is jason khan uh, of khan engineering i'm going to touch on um the load estimating what uh i would go through as far as uh what a tip pretty much how a typical engineer would go through load estimating um typically would come up with a similar uniform load than what was estimated with the tables um so on the next slide we're basically going to add up the roof load wall load floor load so on this slide we basically are showing roof tributary load uh, which is basically half of the the roof load um, we're using a dead load of 15 pounds a square foot a typical live load would be 20 pounds a square foot unless your local snow load is higher than that uh, wall loads would be typically be around 15 pounds a square foot for a, a wood framed wall uh, facade could be something like brick and the brick is around 40 pounds a square foot floor load i usually typically would use 60 and that's based on uh, the ibc um maybe slightly conservative um but it, it i'd rather be a little conservative than than otherwise um, and i'll uh, basically also add up uh, soil overburden the dead load of the wall and the dead load of the footing and basically Based on that information here, we're coming up with a total load of roughly for a for a single story home, 
24 foot wide house of 2,760 pounds per lineal foot. So with that, um, the rules of thumb for spacing for a full depth concrete foundation wall, typically I would space piles uh, for bearing walls between five and six feet on center. Non load bearing walls, I'm going to do five to seven feet on center. Uh, full depth masonry walls, all my walls are typically between five and six feet. And crawl spaces, I typically do not go over five. And if you know your, sub, your foundation is suspect, it's a slab on grade with a turned down slab or something similar to that with a lack of a structural integrity in the footing, you, you may even need to add a beam under the footing to be able to span between piles. So with that 2,700 plus pounds of lineal foot, I'll take that load and multiply it by my spacing to come up with a total, total load. So this is an example of a crawl space foundation and typically the piles for a crawl space need to be spaced closer together than say a deep foundation. And this has to do with the, the fact that uh, if you start spacing these piles out farther than five to six feet, it ends up putting the foundation wall in a bending situation where you would need tension reinforcement in the footing or foundation walls. This is an example of a pile spacing that's too far. The load distribution in the gray shaded areas starts to spread out to the point where this spacing, clear span spacing, ends up putting the foundation in bending instead of straight compression. So this would is not a good situation because the foundation it wasn't necessarily designed to span between these supports. So next we'll talk about how to assess foundation cracks. There are several types of foundation cracks that uh, you'll see in a field. Uh, vertical cracks, sometimes it uh, indicates settlement, sometimes it doesn't. Horizontal cracks, we'll touch on that, whether those are signs of settlement. Diagonal cracks, when, when do they indicate settlement? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And there's also some uh, cracks you'll see in brick facades, whether that's settlement or not, uh, we'll touch on that. When I uh, assess foundation cracks, I basically, my preferred method of measuring the foundation settlement is a laser self-leveling transit. Uh, this, this is the model I use. It has a self-leveling horizontal and vertically, vertical line. And basically I will use this laser to measure the existing structure to determine where differential settlement would be. I typically would measure to the underside of the framing of the home. And you can also project this line onto a grout line or something where you can actually physically see the line and actually physically see if it's a masonry wall, physically see where your uh, differential settlement would be. One type of crack that people would see in the field and possibly think it would be settlement is a shrinkage crack. And a shrinkage crack typically is a vertical crack that's a sixteenth of an inch wide or less. Typically, these cracks will occur at the weakest point of the wall, which would be shown kind of similar to the detail below, like next to a door, next to a window where there's penetrations. I typically would, you know, even if I saw a crack like this and expected, um, anticipated it being a shrinkage crack, I still would measure the foundation to just to verify that there's no, no differential settlement. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that residential walls don't have relief joints and your found concrete foundation wall will always have some type of crack in it um, due to the shrinkage. This is a type of crack here in a masonry foundation wall that would, some people may see these diagonal cracks and ex expect differential settlement. Um, but this is a ba this is basically a bowed in masonry wall, and the foundation wall would be deflected inward, similar to the detail to the right. And a crack, a horizontal crack, would be located at the maximum lateral deflection point. 
And typically this type of crack is not an indication of differential settlement. You can use a, either the laser, a laser level similar to the one I showed to measure the horizontal deflection, or if, if, if you don't have something like that, a plumb, plumb line to measure that lateral deflection would be appropriate. And here's a couple examples of what these cracks look like uh, in uh, the real world. The one in the bottom right hand corner is just a masonry wall with this type of crack. Like I said, you can see the diagonal. A lot of people, a lot of people may see that and think differential settlement, and it's typically not when you see that horizontal line coming off of it. Here's another example of a diagonal crack that would indicate inward movement. And this is basically a sill plate failure or dislocation from the sill plate. And these diagonal cracks basically will start at each corner of the wall and then, and, and then travel up to the sill plate where, again, your maximum deflection is at the top of the sill plate rather than the mid span of the wall. And again, this is not a uh, indication of differential settlement. And again, you can use the laser level or plumb bob, just like uh, in, the, in the last example. And again, here is a, an example of a masonry wall with this type of cracking. Similar to the masonry walls, this uh, same type of cracking can occur in a concrete foundation wall. And to the left is an example with, uh, this could happen with a masonry wall or, or concrete foundation wall, but if there's a brick facade, you'll also see a horizontal crack, basically right at the bond or the, or the rim joist, you'll see a horizontal crack where um, the foundation is displaced inward and it'll also open up a horizontal crack right at, the, right at the rim joist. And again, this type of crack would not indicate settlement. But again, I always will check with a level just to verify that it, that it isn't. I mean, with this type of crack, you you see it enough, you'll you'll understand it when you see it, but uh, typically I'm always gonna measure. Uh, and again, here is a real world example picture of this type of crack. And you can see on this photo, somebody's already installed earth anchor to try and resist that lateral movement and stabilize the wall. Here's a couple examples that I see often of people thinking this is settlement. Um, very often you'll see, see brick lintels that have been neglected and not treated or, you know, there's a little bit of corrosion and over time, the corrosion expands and can actually lift the brick. And you can see at the top, it's a pretty good nasty looking crack and this type of crack would not be an indication of settlement, but it's one of those things you kind of just have to look out for in the field is looking for in the brick facade. If you see cracking, making sure that it's not stemming from this type of brick lintel that's corroded over time. So here's basically a, an example of how I would measure the differential settlement in the foundation. I will use my laser level again to set up in the basement and measure to the underside of the framing with this with this information um, i can determine what you know where the differential settlement is located my rule of thumb typically is if the foundation settlement is less than a half inch i would suggest monitoring the situation um, if it's more than that i start to you know lean more heavily on on uh, underpinning and if, if I do monitor, I would use some type of crack, crack monitor to place on these cracks to monitor over time to see if it's an active, active crack or a dormant crack. And if it does continue to move, then we, you know, we could uh, determine an underpainting plan. Same situation, this is just an example of a concrete foundation wall and, some, and uh, same type of measurement, same type of check basically checking the whole entire foundation for for level again going to the underside of the framing one thing to note is you can also go to uh, the floor top of floor say you say it's a crawl space and it's hard to get to uh, i've measured 
from the top of the floor, but you got to keep in mind like your finishes, what you get tile, carpet, that kind of thing. Or you can go to the underside of the roof trusses too, but trying to make sure that you're not measuring off of something, say like the carpet and the hardwood floors where your height is going to vary. So this is another example of uh, vertical cracks that would indicate settlement. Uh, this, I've seen this a few times, not not quite as um, not quite as often as a diagonal crack, but I believe the vertical cracks uh, you'll see several of them in a row across a wall. And I think I feel like this is more common if the wall has some type of reinforcing in it. Um, where your your vertical crack will be small at the base and then at the at, towards the top of the wall it would start to grow a little bit more than that so it starts to widen as it goes up but you'll have several cracks across the wall and again measuring in the same manner would would indicate what the differential settlement is and uh once we determine um what the differential settlement is, we can determine where to put the piles. So in this, this is an example of a plan we've done. Um, and we're just basically placing the piles where they, where the differential settlement is and where, you know, where it's, the foundation hasn't settled, we're not going to touch or not put piles in it. Um, this is just an example of putting piles where they, where they required for a masonry wall uh, where we've determined the foundation has settled. And similarly with concrete um, foundation walls, we're gonna place the piles where required. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about load combinations and commercial structures. As far as load combinations go, there is a couple different types that you will find in the building code, international building code or in the uh, ASCE for load determination. The first one to your left is strength desired load combinations, and I've kind of broken these down and simplified them a little bit. But um, these strength design load combinations are basically factoring the loads and putting a safety factor on the loads. The one to the left, the allowable stress design load combination, these are going to be straight loads such as like 1.0 times live and dead load and then they'll put a safety factor more on the materials than they would on the on the load itself so typically when designing piles i will use the allowable stress load combinations uh the most common being 1.0 dead load plus 1.0 live load for like foundations for a home um, Typically, I would not be figuring wind load in most areas, earthquake load, unless it is there are uh, heavy loads from earthquakes. But most most of the time, we're just figuring live and dead load. And once I calculate the loads, similar to how we have done it previously in the in the presentation, uh, once we figure out the pile load, I'll industry standard for piles is a two times safety factor that we will include when designing the piles so we'll have a design load and two times that would be your ultimate load so for commercially loaded structures uh, it's a little different but it's also very similar um, typically with commercial buildings i i would suggest an engineer's involvement realistically um, but I'm going to just kind of go through a couple of examples of isolated footings, continuous wall footings, grade beams, and mat foundations. So this detail is an example of a isolated column footing. And typically, in order to underpin this spread footing properly, uh, we don't want to put this footing into some bending situation again. So we may have to cut portions of the footing out and then would typically install at least two piles under the footing and try to get an again straight compression from from this column footing and since you can see these two footings are or these two piles are 
somewhat close together. You may, we may have to uh, include a group effect, the piles if they're closer than three times the helix diameter together. We would have to double check that group effect when designing the piles. So grade beams and continuous wall footings, they're similar to the load estimating for residential foundations. Um, I guess one thing that could be different is in a commercial situation, your footing or grade beam may be heavily reinforced. So you could start possibly spanning your footings or your piles a little farther if you if we know the actual field conditions. And similar rules of thumb for spacing would be used unless an engineer is consulted where he can determine uh, we're gonna space these farther because the footing is more robust. This is an example of a mat foundation. And a mat foundation is basically the footing goes under the entire building and internal structures. Um, the perimeter of the foundation would again be calculated similar to what we've done previously. So we will place footings around the perimeter. Also um, with this type of mat foundation, internal supports would possibly be required uh, because the mat foundation is a uniform footing that would be under the entire building. And typically this type of settlement you'll see with a mat foundation would be more of a uniform settlement. So more of a continuous drop of the footing. So again, you'll have some supports on the perimeter and also as shown in the detail, the top right hand corner, uh, you may need some uh, internal support slab footing, slab piers under under the internal part of the um, foundation. This is an example of uh, new construction um, for commercial projects. This is just an example of to the, uh, a new construction grade beam. So this one shows what would be required for um, a grade beam to span between supports. You'll have, this one shows a two foot wide by one foot six grade beam. And you can see there's reinforcing in the top and bottom of that foundation. So this has been designed to span, I believe this project we span 12 plus feet between supports. And to the right is a new construction pile cap. And this is for an isolated footing. And it'll be designed similar to a standard spread footing for columns, but we'll have a pile cap design with several, at least, typically at least two, two piles, if not more, depending on the loading. Thanks, Jason, for uh, kind of giving your engineer's lens on that. Uh, that's gonna conclude our webinar today. Uh, for the PDH certificates, we're gonna send you a link in your email with a quiz. And if you could just please re respond back to that webinar at intechanchoring.com at the bottom, uh, we'll get back to you within three to five business days with your PDA certificate. And uh, that'll be it. We'll take any questions now. Thanks.